I prepared a whole lot of slides for this morning. And then I prepared again and cut a bunch out. So we'll see if, if we get the timing about right. But once you have some slides and some thoughts that you want to put into something, it's really hard to pull back and say, no, that one's not as important as these others. And so hopefully we get this about right. But the idea of what I was going to be speaking on this morning is just talking about sin. And what do the scriptures tell us about sin? I wanted to get something where everybody could get a little something out of it, whether you've uh, whether you just want some nugget to take away. Uh, that is, or a couple notes that you could jot down, or whether you had something that was a little bit deeper uh, and, and needed something deeper in, and more meaty to grab onto. So we're going to start out with some simple things. Uh, God is perfect, but you are not. Right? Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's a simple statement, Right? But it's something that we have to remember as we go through the world that we are not perfect. We're not expected to be perfect. God knows that we will slip. God knows that we will slip. He designed us in a way that we are not perfect, although we should be trying to be. Sin is lawlessness and unrighteousness. Right? It's the lack of law, the lack of righteousness that puts us in sin. 1 John 3, 4, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. A simple verse. And 1 John 5, 17, all unrighteousness is sin, and there, and there is a sin not leading to death. We look at these things. Um, some sins out there will end up leading to death. Some will not. But all unrighteousness is considered sin. So there's the righteous side of things. And we've got to look at the whole, the totality of the scriptures to figure out these things, right? But there's the, the, there's that which is right, that which is good. The lack of that is unrighteousness, right? Or breaking the law, right? The law that God gave us, those rules that God gave us, those those things that he has told us to do, those things he has told us to stay away from, breaking those laws is sin. Very simple. Sin separates you from God. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. When we look at this, the wages of sin is death. The result of sin is death. The the end result, if sin is not taken care of, it will result in our spiritual death, right? But we get a free gift. There's going to be a way to take care of these sins, and that free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The difference between life and death. When something is a life and death matter, you generally reach out and tell somebody, right? Oh, don't go near those down power lines, right? Be careful, you might slip and fall on the ice. We'll tell people, we'll go take care of people. But sometimes when people are in sin, we go, ah, it's not really my business, right? It might be embarrassing if I talk to them about it. They'll, they'll probably figure it out on their own, right? When somebody's nearing those down power lines, or they're going out, they're slipping on. You've seen four people fall on the on the black ice out there, and then here comes another person wearing nice dress shoes, walking up and just trotting along. You know, are you willing to say something? Second Thessalonians 1 8, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These, these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. There's a separation that we're going to come to on Judgment Day. A separation. We, we see this as life and death. We see this as in the presence of our Lord and outside the presence of our Lord. As Wayne talked about in class, the, the book of Genesis says the, the Lord breathed into his nostrils life, right, with Adam. The Lord gives life. But sin 
can take it away. Separation from the Lord is separating us from eternal life. Some sins are bigger than others. Right? As we as we look at this, uh, and, and it's plainly pointed out here, and you say, well, but I don't understand. How can they be bigger than this? They all are going to separate you. Some are going to separate you faster and farther and quicker. First John, or uh, actually just John, uh, chapter 19, verse 11 from the English Standard Version. Jesus answered him, you will have no authority, authority over me at all uh, unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Interesting, the greater sin. Somebody gave me over to you, that was a greater, it was a betrayal involved in that, as well as the sin. So there's the idea of, uh, and this is this is Jesus as he's before Pilate, right? He's he's before the, the rulers, the magistrates, and he's getting ready to be put to death. And he's saying, but the greater sin is the one that handed me over. The greater sin came from this. So there's this greater sin. There's There's these degrees of sin, but yet... They all separate you from God. They all come with condemnation. So we look here, you can sin against yourself. This is an interesting one as I, as I was going through. You know, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but sexual immoral, the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. You can sin against yourself. You can have a sin that nobody else knows about. It doesn't affect anybody else but it affects you and your soul. God will forgive you. Sometimes we have trouble forgiving ourselves, but God will forgive you. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Lord will cleanse you. He made us imperfect. He is perfect. We sin. We stain our clothing that we get, right? Jesus washes our clothing, washes our soul. God will forgive you. Sometimes we have a harder time forgiving ourselves for those things that we've done wrong in the past than God has in forgiving us. We'll hold on to things from when we were 15 or 18 or 25 or 30 or however long, 22 decades ago, right? Three decades ago, we'll hold on to these things and we will beat ourselves up and think about how bad a person we are. But what we need to realize is that we are children of God. When we are in a righteous state with God, when we have been forgiven by him, we are walking in the light. And there's no shame in walking in the light. Now, it's not that we have to forget that we ever had that because we need to understand where we were and what, what God does for us and what his salvation does for us and how much it wiped away. But we don't have to carry around that guilt and feel ashamed of who we are because what we are is made perfect through Christ because God will forgive us. But we have to forgive each other. Okay. In, and this was a long reading that I cut back because I wanted to I wanted to get to the essence of it. But here it says in Matthew chapter 14, verse 32, then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In his anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Now, there's an interesting phrase right there at the end. From your heart. You ever deal with children that are in a fight and you say, say you're sorry. And they go, I'm sorry. They've got that scowl on their face, though. I'm still mad at you, but I'm saying I'm sorry because Dad told me to say I'm sorry. So I'm saying I'm sorry. <laughs> say you didn't forgive each other. I forgive you. <laughs> right? That's not from your heart. Sometimes you have to go back and you say, now, <clears throat> take a breath. And when you can mean it, 
go say you're sorry, right? And even we'll see children, I don't accept your apology. You don't really mean it. They know, they see right through it. We see right through it when we're not really sorry, but we're made to say we're sorry. What the Lord here is saying, you have to forgive from your heart. You have to mean it. You can't just be the angry, I'm sorry. Well, I forgive you because I have to. The Lord told me I have to forgive you, so I'm going to. Well, clearly you haven't yet, <laughs> right? You have to mean it. You have to forgive each other. Or the Lord will hold his grudge against you. He doesn't, He he's looking at our hearts with everything that we do. He's looking at our hearts and our relationship to him. That sin puts a barrier between us and the Lord. It puts something. We have put some evil thing between us and the Lord. We put it there. He's looking at our relationship. And when you put something between you and the Lord, he can no longer see you because you've hidden behind it. It's like you're the when you walk out into the sun, you say, I want to feel the rays of the sunlight, right? God is light. We say, I want to feel the rays of the sunlight, but oh, let me uh, step behind this tree so I can be in the shade. When you step behind the tree so you're in the shade, you're not feeling the sun. You're not in his light. He doesn't see you because you put something be between you and him, right? That if you put that sin between you and the Lord, you're standing in the shadows. How far is the Lord? One step away. He's right there. He's still shining, but you put something between you and him. He's paying attention to our hearts and our relationships with him. Relaxing the rules is breaking the rules. This is an interesting one. This one that I, I think the, the religious world deals with a lot. You know, well, do we really have to do everything it says in the Bible? I mean, some of that stuff's, you know, got to go every week. I can't. I can't take take time off, you know. I, I can't be in the habit of forsaking the assembly. I can't just decide, eh, I don't need to go anymore. These little things. Relaxing the rules is breaking the rules. Matthew 5, 19, Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. We need to understand that holding tight to the scriptures is seen as righteousness by the Lord. Holding tight to the scriptures. Now, we have to, again, understand we're not going to be perfect. I don't think anybody here could start at the beginning of, of the Bible and recite it. Even pick a version. Reciting it, you'll get to some point, you go, yeah, I don't know, Leviticus 4, <laughs> I don't know what's in there. Okay, well, see, just well, the New Testament. Okay, Luke chapter 4. Pick a random a random chapter and go, what exactly happens there? All of us have some blank. There's some blank where you go, yeah, I need to reread that. I need to go back and look at that. And that's just knowing the word, much less applying it. Right? Do you have to know all of the word to be righteous? No. But you have to be working at applying it. You got to know enough to know what you're applying. So we can't relax the rules. You can't say, ah, we don't want to follow that one. That one's not good. That one, that one's too hard. Right? We can't relax the rules. Again, everything matters. Some things matter more. Interesting that that's what's said here in Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. Woe to you, teachers of the, of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. So Jesus didn't say here, right? What's, what's said here is not, don't worry about the details. Focus on the big stuff only, right? He said, yeah, you, you're doing the detail work, but you're, you're neglecting the weightier matters, some versions put it. 
the more important matters, important matters. As we look at this, there are things that are important in how we deal with each other, justice, mercy, and faithfulness towards each other and towards Christ. That is of the heart. And then tithing these things that they were doing under the Jewish law, they were, they were told to give a tenth, right? They were told to give one tenth of everything that they had. They would do all these little things. Oh, I'm tithing. I, I'm, and they would feel justified while still looking at their brother going, I forgive you because I have to, right? Going back to that bad attitude on the inside towards each other. So everything matters. Some things matter more. Some things are weightier. They're heftier. They matter more because they change how we treat each other as well, right? When you have justice and mercy and faithfulness in your heart, and the love of the Lord in your heart, and the love of the Lord towards your brethren, it shows, and they feel it, and they're strengthened by it. None of you would be strengthened if I counted out a tenth of my dill and set it in the, in the collection tray, right? You're not strengthened by that, but you're strengthened by the love and power of the Lord that we share with each other. Abstaining from good is bad. James 4.17, therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. If you know that it's the right thing to do, if you know you should be doing it, the Lord will present you with many things in life. And when you are convinced that you must do something because it is right, and you decide not to, it is sin. Well, why? Because you decided to do something other than what the Lord would have you to do. Now, this gets into the idea of, well, how is, is that sin for everybody? Right? Is that sin for everybody? As, as we look at this, this, this gets into an interesting question, a conundrum, if you will. The, the deeper matters here. Or if you know it's good to do and you don't do it as sin, to somebody else who's oblivious and doesn't see it happen, they don't have to take action. But you, if you know it and you know it to be good, you have to take action. The idea here is do not violate your conscience. All right, we're going to get into a little bit of a lengthy, lengthy reading, but you can't violate your conscience. Why? Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And you can turn over there if you want to. Uh, now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have uh, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. If anyone supposes that he knows nothing, he has not yet known, and he is not <laughs> he has not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. Therefore. Concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things and from whom are all things, and we exist for him and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him, right? So he's pointing out there's one God. We know there's these, none of these other gods. So we know the idols are fake, is what he's saying. We know you can't worship something. You can worship, but your worship is in vain. We know these things aren't real. We know there's one God. Continue here in verse 7. However, not all men have this knowledge. But some, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor better if we do eat. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block for the weak. For if someone sees you, who have knowledge, dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? For through your knowledge, 
he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And so, by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. Wow, there's a lot packed in here. I told you we were going to get into the meat, and it's actually about meat, right? So as we get here, we understand here, what he's saying is, if the people around you think that something is sinful and you do it anyway, you might cause them to trip up and go, I can't listen to that guy anymore, right? But if the people around you all understand and are all on the same page that that's not sinful, then it's okay to do it. We see this a lot in in our culture and in this country with the decisions on drinking or not drinking, as Wayne brought up in class. You know, some people some people decide, nope, not going to drink for whatever. The, it could be health reasons. It could be uh, for for what they look for look at as uh, as as a, it's very easy to overindulge, right? And want to stay away from it. Don't want to get trapped into that, right? But but looking at the scriptures, we understand that wine was used, right? So not every bit of tiny bit of alcohol is bad. And if you really study it, the grape juice that we have, right? A grape on the vine, if it's puckered around the top at all, there's a little tiny, tiny, tiny bit of alcohol in there. So the alcohol in itself isn't bad, but the idea of drinking, the idea of we're going to get drunk, right? The purpose of your drinking can be sinful. Right. So as you look at this, this is one of the things that just as this, this is eating meat, meat sacrificed to idols. Right. The people that believe in idols, they're going to go, whoo, you're eating meat. The only, the only place we sacrifice bulls around here is in the temple that worships the idol. So if you've got meat on your temple, I know where you got it. You know, your meat on your table. I know you got it up at that temple. I know you're a sinner. Right. So what is this? It is about violating conscience, right? To the And what he's saying is here, to the person that thinks that that meat is bad to eat, they absolutely should not do it because it's about your heart. Your decision to eat meat, even though you think it's bad, is putting that meat between you and the Lord. However, to the person that knows, it's just, you know, it's just ribs. It's just, it's just part of the cow, right? It's just another form of nutrition of protein. And those idols are nothing. And yes, I bought it from the butcher and yeah, it probably was sacrificed at some point, but I'm not worried about what he did. I'm looking at protein, right? To that person, eating the meat is of no consequence whatsoever. So what is sinful to this person over here is not sinful to this person over here. Why? Because of our conscience, the little Jiminy Cricket. For those of us that have seen <laughs> that, that, that have seen uh, Pinocchio, right? Let your conscience be your guide. If your conscience is telling you not to do something, don't violate it. If your conscience says this might be sinful, don't do it. Be sure of something. And what we see with this is a lot of sometimes it's education as, as we see people coming out of uh, different denominations or, or different uh, religious, different cultures, you know, uh, people, Hindus, you know, that's the sacred cow. You can't eat the cow. It's sacred. Okay. Don't eat the cow. If you still think that, right. And I won't eat the cow in front of you because I don't want to offend you, but we can study the scriptures and understand that me eating meat is just fine over here. Right. So this is this is one of those harder ones. So even if it's wrong, uh, even if it isn't wrong, sorry, I left out a word that it's important. Even if it isn't wrong, but you think it is and do it anyway, God knows you have chosen sin over him. It's a really interesting point here because God is always looking at our hearts. Are we choosing him over evil? As we learn more in the scriptures, we learn more good to do. We are required to do more good, as we saw earlier. If you're oblivious to it and you don't understand that you have to do the good there, God is not requiring it of you yet, right? When it's something good to do. We're all in our own relationship with the Lord. We all have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, so sin. Everyone has 
or everyone will. Sin is lawlessness and unrighteousness, and sin separates you from God. So how do you get right with God? The first time comes through belief and an act of belief that will lead to baptism. That's how you get back in right with God. Thereafter, it's through repentance and prayer, changing your ways and asking God to forgive you. But every time, it's about obedience. Every time, it's about doing what the Lord said. So when we avoid sin, we're doing what the Lord says. When we trip up and don't do what the Lord says, we have to get right with him through an obedient heart. The Lord is looking at our relationship with him every day, every moment. He understands that moment when you decide, I'm going to do this anyway, right? That rule that your parents have, no more, no more cookies tonight. And your parents are off in the other room and you sneak by the kitchen and go, I'm going to have one more. That decision that you made, I'm not going to listen to them. I'm going to sneak it anyway. First chance I get. The Lord is aware of our hearts. He can read our hearts and minds. The Lord wants us to be obedient to him and not make that decision that I'm going to put the cookie before the Lord. Whatever that thing is that's in our lives that's tempting us. We have to be with the Lord. So as we look at this, uh, th we've had this up on a couple different screens uh, throughout a couple different sermons. But what I wanted to kind of point out with this is the order matters with this. It doesn't really make sense if you do things out of order. Um, you know, us confessing Jesus before Jesus shed his blood, before Jesus, before Jesus uh, came to earth, before God sent him, there's nothing to confess, right? So as we look here, we've got to start at the at the bottom. We've got to start at the at the first part. We've got to let God do his part, which he did, and he was faithful and he did. But you can't believe in something that you haven't heard about, right? You can't change your ways. Now, somebody that stops smoking because they think that it's better for their health, right, is different than somebody that changes their ways because they believe the Lord wants them to do it, right? Now, what the Lord feels about smoking, I don't know. I don't, you know, it's kind of one of those bad habits, I think, right? Um, but if you stopped getting drunk because you thought your liver was failing, that's a better analogy for us, that's different than stopping getting drunk because the Lord tells you to be of sober-minded spirit, right? It's different. So we have to have a belief in God that causes us to repent, that causes us to confess Christ, right? You can't confess something that you don't believe. You can't say, I believe Jesus is the Son of God, if you don't believe it, if you don't even know who he is, right? Getting baptized before you've believed and repented and confessing, you're just getting wet, right? It takes an act of belief. As we see in the scriptures, they believed and were baptized every time. There's, it comes after these other acts because you have to make a decision that you want to be washed in the blood of Christ. And remaining faithful, remaining faithful if you won't confess, if you're not baptized, if you haven't repented, if you don't believe, you can follow everything that's in the Bible accidentally, and it won't get you to heaven. If you don't believe in God and believe that He's the reason why you're being good, then being a good person doesn't get you into heaven. As Jordan talked about a few uh, months ago, why good people don't go to heaven? They're following the rules of society. They're following the rules. They seem like good people, but they're not doing it because of their belief and their faith. They're doing it because their parents told them to. Right? So these things matter. Order matters. If you're stuck on any of these steps, if you're stuck with sin that you can't get past, if there's something that you need help in prayer or in action from your brethren in order to get that sin out of the way to get you standing back in the light, pull you out from behind the shade of that tree or that rock that you've put between you and the Lord to put you back in a right relationship with God, we will pray for you. When we're singing the song in a, in a, in a minute, you can come down to the front row and sit, and that's a big sign that you need prayers, you need somebody to talk to you right now. If that's too much for you, there's always a phone call. 
There's always the talk in the parking lot, the talk in the back, the talk in the aisle. These decisions that we make, the song that we're going to sing is there to, to play on your heart. It honestly is. It's there to draw an emotional response, to get you to think about the things that you might still have between you and the Lord. It's there to elicit a reaction from you so that you will come down and sit on the front row or so that you will come over and speak to one of the other members and say, I need help. I haven't done this or that, or I know I need to do this, right? The idea here is that we're going to fix our relationship with the Lord. If you need help in fixing your relationship with the Lord, whether it's through prayer or through the need to be baptized, you can come and talk to me as we stand and sing the invitation song.